Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode on Fit as a Fiddle. I have two lovely gentlemen here today to chat with us. Um, one is Harris Kafejic. He is an American board certified prosthetist and orthotist, and Eschen's lead Manhattan prosthetist and residency director. We also have with us today Dr. Robert Rosbrook. He is an orthopedic surgeon and chief of the Limb Lengthening and Complex Reconstruction Service as well as the director of the Limb Salvage and Amputation Reconstruction Center, and also the director of the newly formed Osseointegration Limb Replacement Center, all at the Hospital of Special Surgery, HSS. I am super excited to have um, such lovely and wonderful renowned guests on the show today. We're gonna be talking about a um, really exciting topic on osseointegration, um, the field of prosthetics and how we are able to catapult people into recovery through technology um, and through science in ways that we never saw before. So welcome to the show, both of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I would love, I always start the episode with learning about our guests first, because I, I know that it's the best way that patients and clients and other healthcare providers who listen to the show can really understand the field, the work, and why you do what you do. Every guest on the show is exceptional and have such great um, reasons and backgrounds to be where they are um, because they're so passionate about the work that they do. And so we'd love to hear a little bit about you guys. So why don't we start off with Harris? Why don't you tell us a little bit about what brought you here into this field um, and why and your particular role as well? Uh, yeah, so um, I am the lead processes for Eshin in Manhattan. Uh, what got me interested in prosthetics, I actually have a personal story uh, that, that brought me into it. And, you know, we could spend hours talking about that, but I'll give you the short version. Uh, I was born and raised in Bosnia, um, in Sarajevo, actually. So I was there during the 90s when there was a civil war going on. And um, a lot of unfortunate circumstances kind of occurred to our family, one of them being my brother losing his leg uh, at 11 years old. I was nine years old at the time uh, and it happened right in front of me. Um, so after being, um, after him going through everything that he needed to go through, uh, and us coming to the United States, uh, the field of prosthetics was always in the back of my mind. Um, so that is essentially why I chose to follow a career in, uh, in this. That's amazing. Um, I'm so sorry to hear about your brother and I'm so happy that he has you and that it's driven inspiration to help, um, hundreds and thousands of people. In their lives as well. Thank you for sharing that, Harris. Um, You're welcome. Dr. Rosbrook, would you like to explain and give us a little background on you? Sure. Well, first of all, I want to I want to say that I love working with Harris. You know, he and I have been really, really working passionately together on this on this new field. And we've known each other for a long time, but obviously, integration work that we've been doing in a collaborative fashion over the last five years now has really um, um, functioned to bring us together. In fact, we saw each other 10 minutes ago in real life before this podcast, just because we were dealing with a, an in-person patient. Um, but I'm an orthopedic surgeon and, um, you know, so I'm a surgeon who fixes bones and joints and muscles and stuff like that. And um, I started off in trauma. That's, that was my original sort of interest. And, um, and then little by little, that sort of morphed into complex limb deformity correction and limb lengthening. And I, I realized that I really enjoyed doing not sort of the routine stuff, but the stuff that was a bit more challenging than not everybody else wanted to kind of deal with. And uh, that's kind of the path that my career has taken over the last 25, 25 years. Uh, so I got into limb lengthening and complex limb reconstruction. As an outgrowth of that, um, I got into limb salvage work because that was a perfect combination of complex limb deformity, limb lengthening, and a history of trauma, um, trauma work, uh, because limb salvage often requires replacing missing bone. And then um, the replacement of, you know, limb salvage the, the, uh, the counterpart or the cousin of limb salvage is amputation reconstruction because there are patients who um, are not candidates for limb salvage or sometimes a limb salvage is tried and it doesn't work. And so amputation ends up becoming the most important um, 
reconstructive operation for them. And I, I will say that, and this might be a good segue into what we're going to talk about, you know, amputation traditionally in orthopedics was really considered a bit of a failure. You know, it's kind of like, well, you couldn't, couldn't, couldn't save the leg, there was nothing else to do. And, uh, and so there was a, there has been, I would say, in my, um, in my experience with amputation, sort of that feeling of it being a failure. And, um, and I think it transmits to patients and it transmits to the whole feeling about it. And what's been really exciting in the last five years, I would say, is that there have been a couple of really important advances in amputation surgery that have brought a lot of excitement uh, to the field and excitement and potential and opportunity for patients just to kind of get them to a better place. The truth is that prosthetics have made huge advances you know, over the last 50 years and 20 years and 10 years. But the surgeries hadn't really changed a whole lot. It was kind of like the same surgeries that you were doing, that we were doing now compared to 10 years, 20 years and 50 years ago. And I would say the two, the two real advances, uh, that one of which we're gonna talk about today, which is osteointegration and as well as some, um, some nerve surgery that often goes along with that, have really taken um, amputation surgery to another level, have created a lot of possibilities for people who are not doing well with sockets. Um, and I think taking the functionality uh, of amputees to a higher level. Yeah, wow. There's a lot to unpack there. I know we're gonna do a lot of it now. Um, so in terms of your collaboration, because I, wanna, I want the audience to kind of understand your two different roles in patient care, um, how and when you intervene um, and how that's relevant for a patient specifically. Could you kind of break that down in terms of your professional roles? Oh, sure. So I'll, I'll take it from, from, from my end, from what I see. Every, everything starts with Dr. Roswick. Um, so, you know, without him finding the or having the right candidate for the osteointegration, essentially, you know, I don't get involved in the osteointegration and providing a prosthesis for the patient until that surgery occurs. Uh, so we work very, like Dr. Roswick said earlier, we work very, very well together. So he generally texts me and let, lets me know when he meets certain patients that he thinks are good candidates for the osteointegration. Uh, sometimes he'll have me talk with the patients themselves because they will want to know what kind of prosthesis they will have if they have not had a prosthesis. If they currently have a prosthesis, they'll have some, some understanding how the prosthesis works, uh, but they will still be pretty new to the osteointegration interface that they have. So I'll get involved and I'll, you know, I'll speak to the patients. I'll do any kind of consultations, uh, make sure they are well aware of what's going to happen going forward. Uh, and then the first step um, is the osteointegration surgery itself. And, uh, you know, maybe Dr. Rosby can talk about the surgical aspect of it, and then I can kind of chime back in on setting the prosthesis up for them after that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that maybe the first thing we can also do, and Dr. Roswick, you touched on this, that if there's somebody, a patient that's coming in because they have a limb um, that needs anything, so the salvaging versus the lengthening, I know you use lots of different terms, but I'd love for you to kind of break those different terms down for us, and then how osseointegration fits into that picture, and why somebody would be a candidate for that in the first place. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're in the business of of saving limbs and, and improving limbs. So a lot of what I do is, is um, lengthening short limbs that uh, can be traumatic, post-traumatic, or could be congenital, um, straightening crooked limbs. Uh, but one of the things that comes up with, with, with trauma um, is that patients often are missing a segment of bone. And it's the same thing with, let's say, a tumor, where a patient is missing a segment of bone. And so some of those patients can be salvaged with various limb lengthening, uh, bone transport, um, bone replacement techniques. And if we can do that successfully, then that's the best thing to do. But there are patients for whom that's not a good option, right? I mean, there's not, there isn't a one size fits all kind of thing. And, um, and certainly there are patients who, you know, who are just to our amputees coming in or, you know, they starting off that way in the sense that they've been an amputee for 10 years or 15 years, and, uh, and then they come to see me. 
But I think that, I mean, it's a large topic, and I think that for the time that we have, well, it makes sense to really focus on the osseointegration. integration osseointegration integration is, um, is one way that uh, a prosthetic can be attached to a, can be fit and attached to an amputee's limb, right? So the traditional way is a socket, meaning that, you know, the patient at their residual limb fits in a socket. And really it comes down to is I see for the most part, I'd say 90% of the patients that I'm seeing are people that have not been doing well with sockets. Okay. Now I do want to immediately say that there are a lot of patients who do well with sockets. And I don't want to, I don't want to come across as saying that, you know, sockets are dead and, and that that's not the way to, uh, for an amputee to, to wear a prosthetic. What I can say is there are certain patients that don't do well with a prosthetic, with a socket prosthetic. And, they, you know, there are certain patterns. Some of these patients have a short residual limb. Sometimes they have, a, the shape is difficult. Um, they have poor soft tissue. They have a lot of sensitivity with some of their nerves. And the patients end up seeing me um, either because they seek me out, you know, they, they're not doing well and, and they're looking for an alternative or sometimes they're referred by a prosthetist. So, you know, Harris will, you know, it doesn't always start with me actually. Harris will sometimes contact me and say, hey, listen, I, I'm having a difficult time getting this person comfortable in a socket because of, you know, this and this and this reason. I think they're a good candidate. And, and I think that's an important message, honestly, that, you know, prosthetists have really important relationships with the patients. And, and they do a lot, they're, the prosthetist is there for their patients. Um, if a prosthetist identifies a patient who is having difficulty with a socket, and, and any prosthetist knows what I'm talking about, you know, there are tough cases. And so those are the patients that people should start thinking about osteointegration because osteointegration is a direct skeletal connection of the prosthetic limb to the bone. So there's no socket, there's no suction cup, there's no, the, the limb is not sort of sitting in a cup and sort of being squeezed. It is literally attached to the bone. It's like a terminator type of thing. And it clicks right in. And the big advantages of it are, number one, there's no socket, right? So there's no sweating, there's no shifting, um, there's no pinching, um, there's no bruising, there's no sores that some of these patients have in their sockets. Number two, because they're connected, they, the, the functionality of the leg is, is to a higher level. I mean, they are, clicked in, you know, when they move their muscle and their bone, they're moving their socket. So it is a direct transfer of energy. Uh, they're not losing, they're not dissipating some of that energy. And then they also get tremendous feedback, proprioception, they, they feeling things to a, a different level. And so that, those are the advantages of osteointegration. Um, and it's exciting. It's exciting because people are uh, I mean, in a nutshell, I'll tell you that, you know, we, we, we've seen lots of patients over the last five years and people start at different levels. You know, one person is, is in a wheelchair and we get them walking out of the wheelchair. And another person is, can't wear, a, can't wear a socket and is walking with two crutches and we get them wearing a prosthetic. Another person is walking, but with a really bad limp and they can only wear their prosthetic for, you know, five, six hours a day. And we're getting them walking with a with a much better gait and wearing their prosthetic three times that amount. So we, we really getting people, whether it's a femur, uh, which is a, you know, a thigh amputation or a tibia, a leg amputation, or even upper extremity amputations, we're getting people uh, to a higher level of function uh, with this technology. That's amazing. Um, so I guess my next question for you guys is in terms of your actual communication with patients and um, seeing them after the osteointegration surgery has happened, what does that kind of road to recovery or road of rehab look like compared to if you were to do another procedure, if there was another path for them? Well, maybe, maybe I'll take, I'll take the surgical part. Um, you know, after an amputation, patients are not fit with a prosthetic immediately. I mean, with a traditional amputation and socket, there's usually a few weeks that has to go by where the, the wound has to heal before they, they start getting fit with a, with a socket. 
And it's sort of the same thing with a with a with an octo integration. Uh, there are a few different techniques. We do it as a single stage procedure, which means we put the implant in the bone and we also create the stoma, which is the connection to the outside world, the transcutaneous connection, all at a single surgery. And what I what I typically am doing now is I'll have a period of rest for a few weeks where you just kind of let things settle in, settle down. Um, the implant is a porous coated titanium implant, similar to a hip replacement implant, similar to dental implants. So this is not crazy new stuff in the sense that it, you know, it, it, it is being used. This technology and these biomaterials are being used. Bone grows into the into the porous coated titanium implant. And that's what creates the bond. It's a biological bond. And it literally is attached and becomes part of the bone. Wow. But I'll let them, I'll rest them for a few weeks. And then I'll do a, a gradual loading program where I have them put increasing amounts of weight on a, we call it the rubber footy. And Harris makes that for me. You know, the, the adapter for the prosthetic, the same thing that he's going to use to attach the limb, the prosthetic limb to, he puts a, piece of rubber on the bottom of it, makes it into a little bit of a shoe. And they end up progressively loading um, over the course of a few weeks. And then depending on the bone and depending on the patient, the actual prosthetic will typically get attached anywhere from, I would say, one to three months after the surgery. And, and it, it really depends on the age of the patient, the quality of the bone, um, because when we, when we actually attach the leg, it's generating quite a bit more force on this implant. We want to make sure that it's ready, ready to tolerate it. That's and incredible. It, firstly, I'm like blow. I'm a little blown away that the bone actually grows in and it becomes kind of like it bonds that way. I think that's, I, I didn't put that together for listeners. This is like all very new information to me. I'm learning just like you are. Um, that is amazing. And that's incredible. Harris, I didn't mean to cut you off, please. It's okay. So I was just going to add on to that is that the forces that are put on the limb, uh, so it's not just pushing forces, forces that the patient kind of stands on, but when the patient picks up their leg, there's pulling forces on it as well. So when you have a prosthesis that weighs, that, that has some weight to it, that pulling on the bone is, is not really, the reason why we do a little bit of a weighting pro protocol is to make sure that that osteointegration occurs. So when they are ready when, when the osteointegration, when that bone does grow into that porous coated titanium implant, that's when they're ready to have the pushing forces, also the pulling forces on it as well. Got it. And, um, and, and, and that's why, and, and the, the protocol as far as when a patient is going to get a prosthesis, whether they have osteointegration with Dr. Rosberg or if they're going to go the traditional route is pretty similar, actually, um, because if they do have an amputation without the osteointegration, like Dr. Rosberg said, they, ha they do wait, you know, anywhere between four, three to four weeks until their stoma is healed. And then when it's healed, we kind of jump in and start the shrinking protocol. We need to get the leg shrunk down in order to be able to be fit with a prosthesis. Uh, and that can last anywhere between three to four weeks. And only then do we start casting the patient for a socket. And then as we're casting them, we're doing check sockets, we're doing finalized sockets, and we're making modifications to those sockets. So all that does take time. So by the time they get a prosthesis and are ready to walk, that can be you know, two to three months after their initial amputation. With osteointegration, it's very similar. The only difference is that we do not have to cast the patient for a socket. We do not have to go through the shrinking protocol for the patient. We do not need to make the check sockets. We don't, do not need to make any kind of final um, changes on the socket because there is no socket. So that's the beauty of it is that the limb can go through its own healing process that is Sorry about that, I muted myself. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so the limb can go through the natural um, healing stages of itself without having to worry about putting these external forces such as a socket or anything like that. Um, and um, the osteointegration can be attached directly to the implant. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. So, you know, one of the things that's really cool about osteointegration is, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure we don't go too, it's like most things in life. You don't want to go too fast. You don't want to go too slow, right? You want to go just right. So if you go too fast, you know, you can disrupt the process of bone growing into the implant. 
But on the other hand, the, the gradual loading actually makes the bone, stimulates the bone. So bone is very interesting tissue. It actually likes to be loaded and it actually gets stronger when it's loaded. So there is this fine line between rest and gradual stress, stress in a good way that actually makes the bone stronger, stimulates it to grow, stimulates it to grow into the implant. And this is another really interesting thing about osteointegration and also a major advantage. Amputees have the challenge and difficulty that their bones, their local bone of the amputated limb becomes osteoporotic. And the reason for that is because they're not loading through the bone. That's not the way a socket works typically. So a socket's a cup and it kind of loads around the soft tissue from the outside. And so, you know, a transtibial amputee or a transfemoral amputee, they, their bone actually becomes osteoporotic or osteopenic, which means it becomes weaker. And it's not uncommon to see a, a young person who's been an amputee for 10 years who has a bone, you know, has a bone that looks like somebody that is 30 years older. And the reason for that is because that bone is not being loaded. In contrast, with osteointegration, because there's an implant in the bone, that bone is actually going to be loaded directly. And so what, what we're already seeing is a reversal of that osteoporosis. We're actually seeing the bones becoming more dense, stronger, more healthy. And then the corollary of that is that if you do osteointegration for an early amputee, you actually will prevent the entire osteoporotic uh, process of the bone becoming weaker over time. Yeah. That's just another exciting sort of topic that fits into the whole idea of rehab and, and sort of progressively putting more and more weight on the, on, the, uh, on the limb and the bone. Yep. And I think that's something, I mean, we see this in physical therapy all the time for somebody who has osteoporosis or osteopenia, you know, that we do need to do some amount of weight bearing. Doesn't mean we sit in a chair all day long and that's the, that's the best route. There's a law for it, right? And science that starts with an M. So it's Wolf Law. Well, W W Wolf Law. That's right. I was thinking something else. Um, but yeah, we, I remember learning a lot about that. That it's very important for patients to be active and be. That's mobile. why when I was when I was a kid and I took karate, when we used to when you, in karate you do push ups on your knuckles. Ah. Do <laughs> that is because your knuckles become, your, the bone actually becomes um, thicker and stronger. Yep. And another fun fact, if you look at the x-ray of a professional tennis player's arm, uh, the dominant arm, if you look at their arm bone, the humerus bone, it's much thicker and stronger than their non-dominant arm for the same reason. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it all makes sense. It adds up to Wolf's Law. I love it. So um, any thoughts on how physical therapy plays into this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that as a pitch, as a physical therapist, I'd love for you guys to touch on how you participate in that uh, conversation with PTs. Are there certain restrictions, things that you look for um, when working yeah. with patients? Yeah, so PTs are actually a, a big part of our team as well, too. So we do have a lot of physical therapists that we work with at HSS, and they get involved quite, quite early as well, too. Uh, as soon as the patient is ready to start loading the stoma, you know, the PTs are the ones that are getting them up and, and putting pressure on there and making sure that they do it correctly, you know, and the protocol generally is starting off with 20 pounds uh, and increasing that by five pounds every other day or so, you know, depending on the, the quality of their bone. And they do that, you know, Dr. Osberg, correct me if I'm wrong, five to six times a day for a couple of minutes each time. And that is what starts the you know, the wolf's law that we just talked about, you know, making sure that everything is growing into there. So that's the first aspect that the PT kind of gets involved in. Uh, the next step where the PT will be involved is after the patients get their prosthesis. So after they're ready and after I, after a prosthetist attaches the prosthesis to their implant, um, a lot of times these patients are using muscles that they have not used before. You know, inside of a socket, they, they can become pretty limited as far as what muscles they use to ambulate. And it's quite normal for the patients when they first get their osteointegration prosthesis is to become pretty tired uh, because they're just getting all these muscles firing that they have not used before. Um, so, you know, pizza, working with a PT can be very helpful because 
they can relearn how to use these muscles um, and learn how to use them correctly. And um, at, you know, after the prosthesis is attached, my job's not over then. You know, that's actually just when it starts because um, when they start walking, when they start ambulating a little bit better, there's a lot of um, adjustments that we do need to make in order to, to correct the way their gait is. And um, all of that is in, in conjunction with the PT. That's amazing. Um, I do remember learning, there was one piece in um, Columbia Physical Therapy School, we had a whole prosthetics class. And I remember there was one section on while the limb is healing to work on all the accessory muscles and arm strength and core strength, because this individual's exactly like you said, their gait mechanics were going to completely change initially, especially um, they're going to need to learn a lot of different compensations at first. So I remember that being a big part of initial rehab immediately post-op um, or just, you know, core upper body and around the pelvic girdle too. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think these yeah. are going to love, you know, I, as physical therapists get more experience working with on integration patients, I think as a group, they're going to love, first of all, they're, they're, the role of a physical therapist is key, key, key to everything that, that I do. I mean, you know, it's like, um, it's key to everything I do. I mean, uh, nothing ruins an operation like lack of therapy afterwards. But, um, when you, with an osteointegration implant, because you're just getting so much more responsiveness out of the muscles that are there, right? So, you know, if you can imagine a transfemoral amputee, right, who has a pretty short residual limb, they may be firing their hip abductors, you know, to try to stabilize their limb and their core, but their, their residual limb may be abducting within the socket. We have lots of x-rays like that. And so, you know, that's why the, you know, you'll see these people walk and they have this horrible Trendelenburg gait. And it's because they have functioning muscles, but the muscles are not being transmitted. The, the, the force of the muscles is not being transmitted to the limb because it's just, it's sort of being dissipated in the socket if there's, a, if, if there's not a great fit, which is often the case, depend, again, depending on, on the individual. And so when the physical therapist is working with these patients and they're saying, hey, listen, I want you to do these exercises to strengthen your hip. And hey, I want you to do these exercises to, to work on um, you know, correcting this hip flexion contracture. Well, now you've got a, a, the prosthetic is literally attached to the bone and it actually will make the process easier and, and more effective for the therapist. Yeah. And more natural in a lot of ways, right? It's not so space occupying in that sense. Am I right? That it just feels like it's less stuff there? Well, it's a lot more natural. Patients will often say, I've heard this over and over again from patients who had been amputees for a while that say, you know, this is the closest thing to having my limb again that, in, that I've experienced in a long time. I mean, Harris and I have both heard people. I, I hear the same thing all the time. Yeah, I love it. And, I'm, and also you told me that you guys often work with people who have had um, a particular um, device, whatever kind, depending on the, the, the discrepancy or the leg leg discrepancy, they've been having it for a long time and then they come in years later to do the surgery. So they really feel that difference compared to somebody who may have like an acute surgery and then coming in very fresh with this. Um, I'm sure you hear this mostly from those individuals, right? Who have experienced so the socket. So, so they see the difference. Uh, we see the difference uh, in their gates. We see the difference. The physical therapists see their difference. And, yeah. you know, there's nothing like, you know, treating a patient and seeing them prior to osteointegration, seeing how they walk and just, you know, in our mind, knowing you're going to do so much better after you have this procedure, you know, and, you know, you can't really tell them that you can tell them that, but you can't overpromise it it's because, because it's more fun when they actually experience it. You know, when they come back and have the osteointegration and, you know, relearn how to walk again and a couple of months later come in walking with no crutches, with, with no canes, something that they haven't been able to do before. And they all tell us how happy and excited they are that, that they chose to do this. And that's all this is all about, right? Patient outcomes just comes first. And that's why we do all this research and come up with all this technology and science is so cool, but their purpose is what you guys just mentioned right now. You know, Sneha, the, your program is great because, you know, a lot, a lot of, there's a lot of cool stuff out there that, you know, that we're all doing, but sometimes people just don't, they don't have access to it. They don't mm -hmm. know. And it, it's interesting to me that 
you know, there are lots of medical professionals who don't know. And so that's what's great about a program like this. I mean, we want to basically, we want to get the word out to physical therapists, to prosthetists, to patients, patients' families, friends. I mean, people don't know about this. And, you know, it's, it, it's once people get exposed to this and see it and experience it, um, they're going to be uh, incredibly impressed with what, a, what an advance this is. And I, and I would put a, put, a, put a little plug out there. I don't know how many prosthetists are in the audience listening, but, you know, I think prosthetists should, should not be um, intimidated by this technique. You know, I think that sometimes people, you know, are concerned, you know, the old, the old story, the, um, the horse and buggy makers were a bit concerned when the, the car came out, you know, like, where is our business going to be, you know, disrupted? And the truth is that it's not going to be disrupted. I mean, this is, this is a, it's a, it's an, an alternative way to connect a prosthetic. It complements, it's another important tool in your armamentarium. Not everybody is going to be a candidate for this, but there are patients that will. And all the widgets that go into osseointegration, integration, the connectors, that's a whole cool area. And there's a lot of, um, a lot, we need help. It's not something that, that, that the surgeon can take care of. The, the patient will continue to maintain relationships with their prosthetist, will maintain relationships with their physical therapist. And, you know, it's important that people sort of see this as an opportunity to improve patient care and continue to be super involved. This is not going to push anybody, you know, out of business. This only is going to become more inclusive um, uh, for other healthcare professionals, including mm -hmm. prosthetists, including therapists. Absolutely. And ju ju just to piggyback on that, uh, to bring it back to the beginning, Dr. Rosberg said something that where orthopedic surgeons prior or before would look at amputation as a failure. And sometimes uh, prosthetists might look at osteointegration as a failure because they'll think, you know, I haven't been able to make this socket well enough for this patient so they can use it. But that's not what it is. You know, there, there's a lot of patients who do great wood sockets. And just because a patient might be a better fit for an osteointegration, doesn't mean that any process has failed. It's just meaning that they're giving them the opportunity to use a different form, a different way to connect their prosthesis. And at the end of the day, all of our jobs should be about patient outcomes and doing the best thing for the patient. Absolutely. That was such a fantastic way to sum all of this amazing work up. I have so many millions of questions, but I know you guys are super busy and um, have patience to handle. I'm so grateful you guys made time for the show, um, Harris and Dr. Rosberg. I'm going to put all of the links to your websites um, and your information into the show notes um, for the audience to go and check out this work. There's also a lot of videos as well that people can check out on YouTube. Um, through HSS. Um, that's how I got really interested in some of this work and got a little bit of the background information as well. So I'll throw all of that out there. And for everybody who's listening, um, if you want to learn more, if you have a loved one, um, you know, who's had an amputation in the past or just something to think about for the future, there is so much technology and so many great advancements that we have. And sometimes, you know, it's just a lack of accessibility, really. And so hopefully this has made you kind of think about things in a different way and um, you know opened your mind to a new topic as well so thank you both so much and hopefully we'll be able to do this again maybe in a couple of years when you guys have even more research and more advance in, advancements and something else to talk about as well so thank you well thank you so much for for inviting us this was really a lot of fun and um, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it thank you uh, me too thank you very much Dr. Gazi okay Perfect.